Yeah, no, so so actually I, I thought about it and I kind of want to talk about fair launches. Um, okay. uh, what's the like the time constraint? Yeah, you can take 10, 20 minutes and okay. um, we'll have a 10 minute Q&A after. Sure, um, I think that's, really that's probably like the like absolute maximum is probably for uh, me. So um, I want to talk about fair launches and fair launches are relatively new. We saw quite a big explosion of them last year um, around the, you know, dubiously named DeFi summer where a lot of projects started popping up, um, not necessarily forks, but just projects in general um, that did not have traditional venture backing. And what they did was they, um, uh, they, kind of like invented this mechanism of yield farming or liquidity mining, whatever you want to call it, um, to do a strategy for token distribution. And so you saw this like YFI, um, Harvest, Yam, Cream, you know, Sushi, um, all these different projects kind of like came out of this, like this different um, space because traditionally like your path as a, as a DeFi project um, has been like, I have an idea, I wanna work on this idea, I'm gonna go raise money. And then you go to like get seed and venture from uh, uh, venture capitalists and um, some, you know, most people do it through like, um, you know, large VC firms. Um, but kind of now came like this third path or this third, came the second path where um, you could launch a, a platform that if um, uh, deemed viable by the participants, it like uh, was a, a moment of value creation um, without having a token sale, right? And we saw like the kind of the fallout from ICOs where it was this um, a really kind of fraudulent space um, that uh, projects were launching and like they really had no like probability of delivery and um, we came out of this fair launch movement in my opinion is this the what was happening is that venture and founders were like devaluing the community aspect of of their protocols and so if you look at like um, some of these platforms that are venture backed right their community provides a huge amount of uh, value to the entire platform, but almost all of the extracted value from that has gone to um, the the venture funds and um, to the founders and the community. Um, until um, fair launches came along, would never see it, right? And um, uh, I mean, you just like, I don't, like what it, the line I'm trying to walk right now is like not trying to badmouth other projects because I think that like that's just a traditional or that's just a route that you take, right? And like when many of them took it, there wasn't any other choice, right? You you come up with an idea, you get venture funding, and you go and you do it. So anyway, um, that that strategy of of um, uh, of doing a fair launch has kind of had like positive um, effects and some negative effects. The positive effects are um, there are lots of legitimate projects, even if they're forks that have come out and um, been able to uh, activate the community um, and maybe um, build platforms that actually produce value. And the downside is that there's a lot of scams going on, just like we saw with ICOs. So um, like, for instance, you'll see, it's, it happens on Ethereum, but like for the most part, these happen on like the um, EVM compatible networks, uh, like, you know, BSC and Polygon. Um, and uh, what, what they'll do is they'll kind of like create a yield farm and a yield farm works like this. Um, I'm going to create a new token for pool, what we'll call pool zero or pool one. Um, the, the, you deposit some token, right? 
And during that moment of value creation, based on your proportion of share in the pool of what you deposited, you will get some of our token initially. And then the, uh, the, the, the distribution of the, this like new token is then we'll have a, a, like a pool two. And a pool two, this, it doesn't always go this way, but for the most part, there is a pool two. The pool two is a liquidity provider tokens, which you get from Uniswap or Sushi um, that by, by depositing kind of equal parts of token and um, a pair token, like a USDC or ETH, right? So this new token plus another token combined gets you an LP token. And then you take that LP token and you stake it um, in a staking contract. And um, for your proportion that you hold of that, that pool, right? So like, let's say that you, per, you, your LP represents, your LP token represents 1% overall of the pool, right? Of the tokens that are dropping at any particular time in the block, you will receive 1% of those tokens that drop. Um, and so uh, this is a pretty decent way to um, distribute tokens um, if it's a, um, like, I'd say, like, legitimate project that's um, trying to um, uh, build a community. Um, but you'll see like a lot of these like scam projects will do it for um, their their token and they don't have any underlying project. It actually winds up being a large Ponzi and that it's not very difficult to create a token. It's not very difficult to create a staking contract. You kind of like, just like in ICO mania where they would have like somebody would have a white paper and people would just ape into the, the their um, their currency or token, right? Same thing goes for this, right? It'll be, um, you know, a project says, hey, we have a great team, you know, and uh, and they'll produce a token, a staking contract in a UI, which is like almost boilerplate now. Um, in fact, we like Sushi forked uh, Yam's implementation of that same interface when we first started. So, um, yeah, so, um, so, Fair, fair launch uh, projects, um, I think, have a place in the ecosystem, and uh, I think they provide like a, a decent amount of value for uh, the end user. Um, and I'm going to roll this into like talking about open organizations. Like when Sushi started, like we had um, essentially uh, a treasury of sushi tokens and which at like the time was like worth nothing. Um, and as we like kind of like moved and continued to progress, like this became valuable. And then we started to have to like create an organization, which is difficult, especially because we're all created, like the whole thing was created remotely, right? Like we don't have a specific person or a specific office, right? We're kind of like all across a bunch of different time zones. like. I really don't think there's a time that everybody at Sushi is ever asleep. It's, uh, we're pretty well distributed. And so like, how do you, how do you organize a team like that, right? Like, um, I think uh, like the Ethereum Foundation or Consensus would tell you that you, you can build a flat organization. And, um, I don't necessarily believe that having spent um, some time with both of those organizations. Well, I never worked for the EF, but like working for consensus and like hanging out with the EF. Um, uh, I, I had seen kind of like that organization um, is uh, uh, long, long term, right? You, you kind of say we have a flat organization and what happens is, is that opaque, like hierar hierarchical structures appear. Um, rather than kind of a traditional organization, which we see as bad, but like it at least has a transparent hierarchy, right? I can see, you know, I know there's the CEO, there's the, you know, the SVPs, there's the VPs, and then like I work, you know, under my, like under a director, right? Like that's, that's very straightforward. And so how do you do that, right? Um, uh, and then the other thing to consider is like, how do you reward proportionally the people who are working on it, right? Like, 
sushi, for instance, is not really a job. Um, like the people who are working here, we have like more of an expectation of a founder, right? And how do we re reward proportionally in something that um, uh, in like equity in like, oh God, that's going to get me in a legal trouble. Like how do we reward proportionally in the token distribution? Um, uh, like something that already has a value, right? Like in, in traditional companies that are coming out, right? The, they're venture funded, the founders take some, the venture fund takes some, they leave some for growth and then they, they go, right? And, and when, they're, when founders are awarded that, that, um, that equity, there's really, it's really not a big deal because it's worth nothing, right? But for, in the instance of sushi, it's different because it's worth something. And so we're kind of like pricing what someone's doing. Um, although our expectation is the same as somebody who's a founder. And so that's like one thing that we're kind of like slowly working on like understanding and coming up with a solution for. Um, we don't really have a good solution yet. Um, and the other part is, is um, there will be projects that you'll incubate that will make sense to launch their own token. They're an entirely another project essentially inside. You're expecting those people to behave like founders. How do you reward them proportionally to their efforts, right? Like um, that's an open question. No, nobody knows, right? Like even if you look at like YFI, who's, you know, um, like a, gold standard of, of an open organization that was fair launch. They, they continued um, uh, working first. Uh, this is just how communities work, right? The first uh, proposition that came for voting uh, for YFI was to cap the, the, the supply. Well, after some time, they didn't have a treasury at YFI. So what did they need to do? They, um, they needed to mint some more tokens. They had like kind of control of the minter with their multi-sig. Um, which was like, ironically, this was a controversial conversation because they wanted to mint 666 Wi-Fi tokens, which at the time, I think I was like, I think Wi-Fi was like um, 30K. Um, so yeah, like something like $20 million worth of like tokens. Like they figured out a way to reward, um, you know, them proportionally or at least, you know, the team brainstormed away, but it was still controversial. Like what's the expectation from Andre or Bantag, two people, two high performers who could obviously go someplace else at any time. Um, is the expectation that they're gonna continue to work forever for free, right? Like, or, or forever for like, you know, a salary? Like, what, what is it, what it like, like uh, Andre, like, you know, like deploys to test nets and the contracts on the test net get value accidentally. So like what exactly um, is the expectation? So that's like still a, a big open question. It's like proportional reward for effort. Um, uh, yeah. And so um, running open order is hard. Um, one thing that uh, always gets to me is this idea of like, well, this is before we had like um, better organization, but like, how do you keep somebody from running away with your domains? How do you like, how do we have like property rights? How do we keep somebody like we can't control everything with a multi-sig, right? Like we're getting closer, but like in a, like in a timeline long enough, everything's going to be like capable of being controlled with a multi-sig. But right now it's just not like, how do I keep somebody from like, like locking me out of the GitHub? You know, like there's like this like trust element and how do you manage that? And that's another like big problem. Um, I think we've like come up with some solutions over time, um, but like, I think the answer for every organization is gonna be different. Uh, so um, so should I just read the questions? Yeah, um, or, or, you know, Greg or Aiden, if you want to even unmute yourselves to ask the question just for the, for the video, that would be, that'd be cool. So I actually only found out today about this because uh, our legal team did a lunch and learn on open source licenses and the new sushi swap license was brought up and I totally missed this on the v3 release. Um, 
so yeah, would love to get your thoughts on the, let me make sure I call, I call its name correctly, the business source license. You're talking about the Uniswap V3 license. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right on. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, uh, like we believe in open source. Um, in fact, we wouldn't exist if it wasn't for open source. Um, uh, we're Everything that we we have had some issues with this, right? And that actually goes back to one of the problems that we have in the organization is like proportional reward for effort. Um, uh, everything with the exception of one thing has been GPL3 um, and we will continue to do that into perpetuity. Um, uh, business source license. This is a funny thing is like um, people say, oh, it's still open source. Um, but it isn't. Open source isn't a um, open source isn't a behavior. Open source is a license, right? Like it's um, these particular permissive licenses, uh, GPL, MIT, um, like Creative Commons, public domain, unlicensed. Those sorts of things are open source licenses. A business source license is not um, an open source license, no matter how much spin you want to put on it. Um, I kind of, so I kind of missed like the, I guess the, the whole thing, but what, like, what is Uniswap's business source license? Like, is, it's, is it just like, a so only they not can use open their source? Code. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, so they can do kind of whatever they want. I guess they're allowed to. Um, well, thanks for that candid response, Joe. Um, I yeah. probably could have asked you it outside, but I think it's important no, could... that people know that, like, you know, that, yeah, I mean, the way that I understand it and is, you know, open source is the ability for someone else to use the source code, even if, you know, commercial purposes might be, you know, not allowed in certain specific situations um, to not be able to use it at all is definitely against, you know, just, I think what Richard Stallman would say if we were in Berlin with him again. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, like, and, and like the, the LARP is, is that like, I want to pretend like I'm a, you know, crypto anarchist, but in all actuality, I'm just like a, a business person, just like everybody else. Right. Like that's the LARP. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, we, we will never do that. We'll, we'll never release a business, well, as long as I'm working here. Um, uh, we'll never close the source on anything. We had one project that we co-developed, Bento Box and Kashi, um, that we don't have the license to because we were co-developing and the person who we developed it with owns the license. If they, get, if they gifted us that license, we would GPL3 it immediately, but we don't own it, so. We have an unlimited license for ourselves um, that they license to us, but we don't own it. Um, yeah, and like um, this, that like the, so, so many things that have come before me, you know, that that I'm literally relying on every day that are open source. You know, it started with you know Linux and. Um, now it's like, you know, like everybody touches in a day um, LLVM for sure, right? Um, if that didn't exist, you wouldn't exist, right? Um, um, ERC-20, the, the underlying platform of Ethereum, like, like the, the level of complexity and intelligence that has gone into Ethereum um, and the entire platform that is just completely in 100% open source. In fact, the reason um, Uniswap in particular was open source was because they received a grant from um, the Ethereum Foundation. The Ethereum Foundation is part of your um, um, grants proposals. They require you to have a permissive license on your software. And so like, what do you, what do you think are like the ramifications of um, Uniswap running with this business source license kind of thing is it is it's that doesn't sound good not to like shit talk <laughs> another project but yeah um, oh that's one i'm fine but um 
The, uh, um, you know, um, I, I don't know, probably nothing, right? Because apparently we are all crypto anarchists until it's like we start worrying about, you know, the n amount of money that we have in our bank account. Right. Yeah, um, right, exactly. Cool. And uh, Chris, um, you asked July 20th, 2021. Mm. I'm not sure what that question is. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do something. We're gonna do a oh. launch. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, some good questions. Seems like questions coming in. Maxim uh, asks, how can this type of license even be enforced, even if the person who forked it um, got caught? What stops users on chain from using the fork Uni V3 or whatever else? Nothing. Yeah. be in, entirely impossible to censor that unless you were censoring as a block producer. The other thing to think about is, is like, is like, is uh, like every node has to replicate a copy of that. Is that, are they able to, are, are they able to replicate a copy of that? If you're using some, some sort of, um, uh, closed source licensing, uh, TBD. Cool. Um, and Johnny, hey Johnny, um, he says technically GPL is a restrictive license or copy left. Um, yeah, like I've, Apache two MIT are permissive. G, I was just, I was just being an asshole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I came on here just to troll De Delong because I love him. <laughs> what's the what's the one AGPL? Is that the viral one? The AGPL, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's it's copy left of the worst kind. Yeah, if you like, if you like, even like import a library that's a gpl like you're fucked forever it's just like uh yeah everything that it touches um it's like the king midas but like but for non-commercial purposes cool cool all right um if anyone else has any questions um please feel free to ask it or unmute yourself and ask it um Hang on, this Bitcoin's a really good one to talk about, right? Like Bitcoin sure. is like, you know, there's so many like novel inventions that happened with Bitcoin, like that just like from the white paper on down to write like the design of UTXO to the use of base 58, right? Like there are so many things and then the Satoshi is like, here you go. You know, I gave this to the world. Um, I think like the the arrogance to think that your like software is more important to the world than bitcoin core um is got to be pretty high lots of questions rolling in um should i just uh say what's going on in the chat uh, most bitcoin stuff is mit the firefox license is also pretty permissive um anthony asks how does miso help new projects scale yeah, so Miso is a platform that we have uh, for IDO. Is it this like kind of like initial uh, token launches? Um, and uh, uh, so right now there isn't there isn't a legitimate ungated token launcher um, out there. Um, and like kind of one of the things that we are working towards with Miso, it isn't done yet. It's like all of that, that process that I described of like um, launching a token and, and rolling into kind of like <laughs> liquidity mining. That's my kids, they're home now. So maybe some screams. Um, um, so the, the, this whole like platform is rolled into one. Um, and, and so you'll launch your token. You can do like Dutch auction, batch auctions, token sales. Um, and then we can roll straight from there into kind of like your own liquidity mining program. So you can then um, create a uh, sushi. <laughs> uh, like, give me a second. Let me switch my, uh, my mic over. Cool. Yeah. Yay for school. Um, like, uh, uh, so, so yeah, so we'll help like um, projects that are fair launch like us like launch their own fair launch projects as well. Cool. Uh, and and one last question from Anthony again. How would Miso integrate in a new projects community building strategy? I mean, I think that's the power of of fair launch projects is is that that it does like 
um, like deliver a huge um, uh, community building aspect. People who are there, who are capturing the tokens value, who have faith in the team, who aren't necessarily like providing financial resources until like, you know, you're like cool, cool, you know, two situation. It, like that builds um, a, a lot of community. It allows like people to kind of like discover the project and kind of like believe in it early and uh, affect the price. Cool. All right, Joe. Thank you so much for um, for your talk on fair launches, open organizations. Just all in all, like the the discussion around um, open source licensing. We really appreciate um, your time. Um, Cheers. I love the the headband, by the way. I feel like that's like a bored ape. I've seen that on like a bored ape NFT. Yeah, I got it. Um, I got it at like, you know, the kind of like place that you go in the mall that has like little anime figurines and shit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like we'll have like My Hero Academia, like wall scrolls and stuff. And <laughs> they're like, I was like, oh shit, I'll get one of these. It's pretty cool. Nice. I'm loving the getup. Um, cool. Thanks again. Um, 